Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll get the latest on reports that Arizona's voter registration database was recently hacked. Also tonight, new rules for commercial unmanned aircraft systems or drones are now in effect. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. It's election day with party primary races for U.S. Senate, the state legislature, the Corporation Commission, and Maricopa County Sheriff, all on various state ballots. So far, no reports of excessive lines or other problems that plague Maricopa County during the presidential preference election in March. A polling location in Phoenix opened about an hour late due to poll workers failing to arrive on time, but otherwise, everyone from U.S. House and Senate members to neighbors down the street have cast their ballots with little trouble. I vote early and send my ballot in because I like to spend my day on election day talking to voters and thanking them for voting. We've seen an increase in early voting over the years and I think it's been a great thing for Arizona because it increases voter participation and it allows you to have plenty of time to make your choices in the comfort of your own home. A programming note, we will have full analysis of today's primary vote on tomorrow's edition of Arizona Horizon. The FBI has confirmed that election databases in Arizona and Illinois were recently hacked. Joining us now to explain what this means and if any Arizona voter information was compromised is John Yannarelli, former head of FBI cyber investigations in Arizona. Good to see you back. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, were you surprised to hear that Arizona's voter registration database had been hacked? No. Anything in the cyber world does not surprise me. The reality is there's so many people out there and governments as well that want to hack anything American so that they can try to disrupt what we're doing here in this country. The report was Arizona and Illinois. What was that? It was there any connection there at all or did these two just happen to have an opening? I think they had an opening at this point. Of course, the FBI is looking at it. The important thing that Arizonans want to know is that their personal information has not been compromised. But it's still a big issue of has their vote been put in jeopardy in the future. So the database was probed, but no entry gained. Was, so was someone just nosing around here? What, what, was, what was going on? I think someone was looking to get in and was unsuccessful because Arizona has done a good job in trying to protect their software, their system with the proper security. But that doesn't mean they're not going to be successful the next time around. And so no personal information of voters, no voter information, none of that was compromised? None of that was compromised, but you know, in this day and age, the reality is almost everybody's been compromised at some point. I'm more concerned with someone taking the vote that you cast and then turning that vote for the other candidate, swaying a possible election. Well, I want to get to that in a second here, but back to what happened uh, as far as recently with this voter database. Any connection to the DNC, Democratic National Committee, email system being hacked? Because I know they thought that Russian government <coughs> operatives were uh, at, at play there. Similar here? You know, it seems similar. I think what you're seeing is different people out there are trying to hack. The reality is, will Russia want to actually get in and change the election? They're probably too smart for that, but everything they do in this vein short, sort of undermines the United States. It says that we're not as competent in doing things as perhaps they are. So that may be their end game in this occasion. So maybe not overtly politically motivated, but politically motivated nonetheless sort of a counter-espionage type of event. They don't necessarily want Hillary over Donald, but what they want to do is show that America perhaps is inept in certain areas where they are superior. Could this just be a crime syndicate wanting to get information to sell IDs to thieves? You know, there are so many ways to get information out there that is a lot easier to hack. It's probably not thieves that are looking for information. If I want your credit card information, if I want anything else, I can get that pretty easily by hacking into stores, banks, anything retail. Voter information is protected fairly well. Could this have been something that some automated system that just bombards, 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 all of a sudden, ooh, uh, we got a connection here, and no one even, people may not even have been at the helm of this. That's exactly how it works, by setting up these botnets, which are essentially taking over hundreds, if not thousands of computers, commanding them to go out and search for open nodes, places that can be hacked. Probably somebody's behind it. It may be a government behind it as well. Arizona was alerted by the FBI. 
typical in these kinds of situations? Absolutely. The FBI, when we hear and the FBI hears of something having taken place, they're going to let that entity know so they can take the proper steps to try to protect themselves. How does the FBI hear about these kinds of things? If the state didn't know and had to be told by the FBI, how does the FBI know? Well, it's the FBI's job to know. They have people and very smart cyber agents that are out there working. They also work with a lot of the community, not just sources, informants that provide information, but more importantly, the private sector, people willingly looking at things when they stumble across information, they call the FBI, they let them know. It's establishing those relationships that are tripwires. It's helping to keep us safe. Interesting. So the FBI then alerts Arizona. Arizona kind of shuts down the system here for several days. Uh, typical? That is, you want to shut the system down to make sure that the information is secure, figure out where the entry has taken place, let's close that entry, and at the same time, let's make sure nothing's in there like spyware that would continue to give somebody access in the future. And I referred uh, uh, recently here to saying, you know, bombard, bombard. The Illinois uh, elections director said that they have been under constant attack for the past 10 years. I mean, you, be, what, you just put a shield up and hope it works for the best? I think that the election system has to look at the reality that if it's computer related, it's going to attract some type of hackers. We have to have a system in place as a backup just in case. We have the mail-in ballots, we have people casting their ballots, the touch screens today, things like that. Computer technology isn't quite there yet. There is still potential to get in. Until that science is more developed, we have to make sure that the election is not going to be compromised. And you referred to this earlier. Let's get to this right now. The idea of not just getting voter information, maybe stealing some IDs, but actually changing votes, changing the outcome of the elections. That's entirely possible, isn't it? It certainly is. It's what I think the end game and the goal is here. It's one thing to go in and steal personal information, but if I can sway an election, have a candidate put in office that otherwise might not be elected, that perhaps wouldn't be elected because he, him or she does not have the public trust, that can have ripple effects throughout politics. It's not just on the presidential level. It's all the way down to local level, sure. city council, mayor as well. So a lot of different things could happen in our world if the election was swayed in such a manner. Is, is, is the federal government, uh, state government, local government, are all of these entities, are they capable of keeping that shield in place? Or is this, is this a constant effort to renew, renew, renew? The problem is, as capable as they are, and they are capable, technology is continually evolving. We're always just a half a step behind the criminal because once we come up with a system, they're looking to find a system to break into our system. And these criminals often are criminals from other countries. Could this be internal? I mean, what do you think? It can be either. What we're seeing as crime in general, in the days past, certain people would grow up, become criminals, and they might rob a bank or a store. Today, everybody's growing up with a computer in front of them. It's so much easier to rob a bank with a computer than it is with a handgun. You're going to see more and more cyber criminals as this generation and future generations grow up. Where are we going to see these cyber criminals coming from? We're going to see them coming from everywhere because there's always been a criminal element in this world. There always will be. Now, with the breakup of the Soviet Union years ago, we've seen more gangs over there. China, we see China's government inspiring criminal acts. We certainly have the problems with North Korea. At the end of the day, when we look at what happened in Arizona and Illinois, it wasn't some sophisticated hack. It was somebody within the office clicked on a link, downloaded some malware that gave a person access to the computer system. It all goes back to basics. Be careful on what you click on and make sure you're aware of what you're downloading. And again, here in Arizona, no uh, personal information, no data regarding voters and their IDs and such. But in Illinois, it sounds like they did kind of get through a little bit. They did get through. Here in Arizona, no votes have been changed, no personal information sacrificed. But in Illinois, it looks like they did get personal information, not necessarily changed votes. So. I'm an elections director, I'm a federal official, I'm, I'm supposed to be watching out for these kinds of things. What do you tell me? What advice do you give me? What do I need to do next? If you're an election official, the first thing you want to do is make sure you have your cybersecurity personnel in place. The time to be looking at protecting your system is not after you've been notified you've already been hacked. You want to make sure you have the latest technology and you have the people that are not just putting it in there, 
but monitoring the system, looking for anomalies that will come into the system. You can recognize this is someone trying to break in. We need to stop this immediately. And so far, there are folks out there doing that to a certain degree. Yes, they do have folks like that. And they also have the FBI behind them that is looking at these problems as well. All right. Good information. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Federal rules that govern the use of commercial or non-hobbyist drones took effect yesterday. For more on the new do's and don'ts of unmanned aircraft systems, we welcome Seth Shutnik, a former Navy pilot and now an attorney at Fenimore Craig. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Good to have you Thank here. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, federal f drone rules, they take effect yesterday. I mean, what's the impact? What's the impact on the overall industry? Uh, it's a huge impact in the overall industry. This is the first time the FAA has come out with comprehensive rules for commercial drone operators, for commercial operators of UAS, unmanned aerial systems. So uh, essentially, if you are going to operate a UAS uh, for any type of commercial purpose and earn money for it, you are now fall under this new Part 107 regulations of the FAA. And we're talking about drones 55 pounds or less, correct? Yes, that will, and keep in mind, that includes any type of payload. So if you are, uh -huh. if a commercial operator is planning to use a drone to take any type of package around, uh, the drone and the payload cannot weigh more than 55 pounds together. Interesting. I didn't think about that because I thought I thought about a 55-pound drone, and you're saying a 55-pound drone better be empty. Ex well, exactly. Uh, you know, it might be, if you get a light drone, you can fit a lot of pizza boxes yeah. or something underneath it. All right. I, yeah, going through this, explain some of this stuff for me. You must keep a drone on a visual line of sight. Yep. What does uh, that mean? Okay, so uh, it means what it sounds like. <laughs> you draw a line. If you, as long as you can see it, you're within the rules under the FAA. So you go behind a building, you go behind a tree. Uh, if you can't, any, little, you, if you can no longer see the drone that you're flying, you are no longer within a visual line of sight of that drone. And that's what the FAA is making sure that a remote airman, someone flying this drone, can see it at all times and maintain safety. All right. Uh, daylight, twilight operating hours only. Yes. So uh, civil twilight, essentially 30 minutes prior to sunrise rise to 30 minutes after sunset is when you're allowed to operate these things. So uh, I mean, that's going to be a real limitation on people if you're thinking about going and uh, watch it, looking at stars, yeah. trying to see lights over a city. Uh, no, absolutely not. Under this new part 107, you are going to be restricted from doing that. Okay. You mentioned seeing lights and, and trying to look over things. What about height and speed restrictions? Okay. Well, the height restrictions is going to be 400 feet. So you need to stay below 400 feet if you're operating this for pay and or commercial use. And then speed restrictions are going to be about 100 miles per hour. Andrew, you can go 90 miles an hour and just zipping around? 
Exactly. If you're taking a package, so uh, anything that you're carrying or you're using this for a commercial purpose, you can go up to 100 miles an hour. And that, of course, is to minimum, minimize the risk to other aircraft, I would Absolutely. Imagine. Absolutely. Okay. It, the, really, the height restriction is what's going to limit that. No flights over people who are not involved in the operation? Absolutely. So this is going to be one of the, the largest... Uh, really limiting factors for uh, this rule. So uh, operators that go and they get this remote license and they're going to operate a UAS for commercial purposes, they cannot operate it over people that aren't involved with the flight. So populated areas, someone's home, people that where they're standing, you really need to be aware where people are at. Well, so, so let's say that Amazon out in West Phoenix somewhere decides they want to deliver a, a, a beautiful gift to Ted. Okay, they got to fly across the valley. If they, if they fly over a, someone else, that's a no-no. It is. So, uh, which really what shows is this is essentially the first wave of regulations that the FAA is coming out with. They, uh, right now, there are bids and Congress is working on coming out with a whole other set of regulations for commercial carriers and things like that. Uh, it, it makes sense, though, because you're trying to protect people and property on the ground. Absolutely. So, really, a, a lot of the industries that this is going to affect now are things like farmers, um, ranchers. Um, photographers, roofers, real estate agents, um, law enforcement, firefighters. These are the types of industries that this is going to have a really large impact on. And it's going to impact anyone uh, who's not 16 years old yet. Huh? you got to be 16, huh? <laughs> exactly. You need to be 16 or older to go ahead and you go to the FAA, you take the exam, and you go ahead and you get this remote airman certificate with a, what's called an SUAS rating. Talk about that certificate because, it, you know, it, it sounds to me like this could be somewhat involved. It, or, or should it be somewhat involved? It, it is. And, and, and absolutely. I believe it should be. Uh, so it has essentially you need to go and you take a test with the FAA at uh, any number of FAA centers that offer this test. You pass the written test. Uh, you'll likely take the practical test with them as well. Uh, you go through. You may, they make sure that you, A, understand the rules, the regulations that are uh, concerning you, and then uh, make sure that you are of age. You also do a background check under the TSA that are part of the regulations. And once you do that, you get what's called a remote airman certificate with this SUAS rating. And... Then you get your, you got your certificate, you got your machine, it's not 55 pounds, it's doing whatever, it's not flying mm -hmm. over people, it's going the right speed, it's going the right, all this kind of business. Uh, you got to make sure it's safe, don't you? I mean, what kind of quality control is there? Uh, well, uh, safety is a, is a broad word. So essentially, you need to operate uh, you need to operate your drone uh, with safety in mind, within uh, safe standards. So there really isn't I mean, what's considered safe to someone might not be necessarily safe to someone else. So it, it's a broad word. Again, this regulation is one day old. There is yeah. uh, a, as this regulation gets flushed out over time, I'm sure there will be lots of case law in the future over what's considered safe and what so isn't. So it's not necessarily like with autos, you, you know, with registration. Remember in the old days with automobiles, they had to make sure that brakes were working and all this kind of stuff. You don't see that much anymore here. But they don't do that with these these drones either, huh? Not, not at this time. Uh, you, right now, there's no regulation that you need to go and have the particular drone that you're flying checked by the FAA. But again, as these regulations uh, mature, that might be something that happens in the future. And as they mature, we might see some of these regulations waived on an individual basis? Uh, we could. Again, uh, being one day old, uh, time will tell what the FAA is willing to waive and, and grant exceptions for and what they're not. Uh, that's what law firms like ours are out there to help with. I, I would imagine so. And these, again, this is commercial stuff. What about the hobbyist? What about the back the shade tree droner? You know, yeah, there is no change uh, under this new law for the, the shade tree droner, if you will, <laughs> uh, for the hobbyist that's going to go out and fly. You, can, you always have to operate your, uh, your aircraft in a safe manner. Uh, again, you need to operate it during daylight hours away from people. Those laws and regulations haven't changed. What this does is this really sets the landscape for this entire industry and it it allows consumers, it allows companies that now they understand the regulations that they need to abide by. So it makes it much easier. It really opens up the playing field for a lot of different industries to come in and use this incredible technology that's just starting to build. And I imagine, obviously, you know your stuff here. Do you guys get a lot of call? Have you been getting a lot of calls on oh, this? We do. That, that's what our firm does. We have an autonomous systems and aviation and aerospace practice group, which I'm a part of at our law firm at Fenimore Craig. Uh, we've been uh, around for 135 years and simply changed with the times from representing railroad companies to car manufacturers and now uh, airlines and drone manufacturers I, I, if you will and I was gonna say that indicates that you guys see this as a growth industry it sounds like it is a growth industry a absolutely I think we are on the the initial stages of a large wave uh, 
really the, the sky's the limit, no pun intended, uh, of what these things can do and what, what they can mean to different industries. We are just starting to scratch the surface and the FAA is wisely coming out and laying the playing field for this so people can do it in a safe and efficient manner. Now, I, I read somewhere this could generate $82 billion over the next 10 years? Uh, yes, uh, as staggering as that number is, uh, again, like I said, just some of the industries that are impacted by this, but again, that's just scratching the surface of what other types of industries can do this. I mean, you've got drones that cost as little as $50 all the way up to $1,500, $2,000, $10,000. This is a large industry where small players, large players, it, it really it is wide open to different types of manufacturers, but it's not just the manufacturers of drones, it's what the drones can carry, right. uh, cameras, now you start, again, eventually the FAA is going to get to the point where they are starting to deliver packages. So you've got an entire packaging industry that's going to change. The lighter you can make the packaging, the more things you can carry underneath the drone. So Could it be possibly a situation where you might have lanes, like oh, maybe over railroad tracks or maybe over power lines or something? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, the FAA has not asked me for to build the regulations <laughs> yet, but if I were to look in the future, some of the smartest ways to do it would be just simply building a highway in the sky. You take yes. the existing infrastructure of our roads, you now put it at four, 200, between 200 and 400 feet, and that's where the drones would fly. It's, it keeps over uh, out away from houses, buildings, things like that. Uh, then, yeah, you can follow along railroad tracks, power lines, and everything. It, but. It, it's the Jetsons, isn't it? I mean, it really <laughs> is the Jetsons. It is. It, we, we are entering that stage, I'd say. All right. Good to have here. Thanks Thank for you joining very much. us. We I appreciate, appreciate it. it. And Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, we will have full results and analysis of the major races in today's primary election and what it all means in regards to the general election in November. That's on the next Arizona Horizon. If you want to watch tonight's program again or see details of what we have done in the past or what we plan to do in the future, check us out. azpbs.org slash horizon. That's azpbs.org slash horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.